Hello boys and girls, friends old and new from all corners of the earth, welcome back to the channel. I'm Stian and today we're going to run through this beautiful uh, Grand Seiko GS61, a pretty rare Grand Seiko version, only made in a few uh, months in 1972. So without further ado, let's get going. This uh, 6145-8050 is certainly not your standard Grand Seiko, as mentioned it's uh, very rare made on in a limited time period. It has a 36 BPH movement, a 6145A. It has a beautiful dial and it has this faceted crystal. This type of design with the angular case as well is perhaps more known in the King Seiko Vanak series. But this watch looks just spectacular. There are a few issues, however. The mineral glass, faceted glass, uh, has uh, quite some chips and some damage. So we'll have to do something about that. And uh, the watch itself uh, is uh, really in need of some uh, tender love and care. Doesn't run so well. So let's see what we can do. We also see that this uh, gold medallion on the case back it's a little bit worn, but there's nothing we can do about that, unfortunately. So when I said that the watch doesn't run so well, I mean, relatively speaking, this would be good for a lot of watches. But then again, this is a very high uh, quality uh, movement. So we should be able to get a little bit more out of it than uh, this. But first we have to get the case back off. And it's actually a very tight, so we're going to have to use this uh, case back opener tool. Now it's very common to see scratches on case backs. And that's mostly because people try to open the case back, either without the proper tools or without the proper skills or without the proper caution, or maybe all of them. So we want to make very sure that we have a good grip on these notches in the rim of the case back. We also use a little bit of uh, plastic just to further protect the case back. There's an old saying that uh, a good tool is uh, half the work. So then we can open the case. And there we have it. The Psycho 6145A, 36,000 beat rate. This movement is uh, perhaps more standard in the terms of uh, structure and design than a lot of the other Psycho watches we've looked at so far. It has the magic lever for uh, automatic winding, which is a very interesting uh, system. We'll get to that uh, a little bit later. But first, we can uh, see this uh, fantastic dial. Just really gorgeous. Very good condition, and it's very nice uh, green color. Most Grand Psychos are uh, very stylish, but also quite uh, strict. So typical uh, just uh, silver sunburst styles. And then you have some uh, really dark uh, blue, navy blue, that look almost black. And having uh, this kind of dial is uh, quite unique. The rotor is uh, fixed with two screws and underneath it you have this asymmetric uh, post that then works with this uh, magic lever to wind the movement. So 
we're first going to take off the automatic module. So this design is uh, quite similar to Rolex in a lot of ways. You have the automatic module right under the rotor and then the standard movement underneath. See the quick set uh, date, works nicely. And the switch over has this little spring that acts both to snap the date over quickly, but also as a safety mechanism meaning that nothing bad will happen if a user uses the quick set date as the automatic uh, changeover is happening. It is general practice to recommend that you don't uh, use uh, quick set etc. Uh, between uh, 9 o'clock in the evening and 3 o'clock in the morning. But of course newer watches and then we just saw this one have this kind of safety built in. Still it's a good habit to uh, keep the hands at the bottom of the dial if you're using the quick set. So let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, what uh, 36,000 beats per hour actually means what kind of uh, consequences it has. In the lever escapement, which as we mentioned uh, before, was actually invented in England by a watchmaker called Thomas Mudge. But in its current form is something we call the Swiss lever escapement. The most common beat rate back uh, in the day was 18,000 uh, beats per hour. And that would then uh, translate into five beats per second if you divide by 3600 seconds per hour and those five beats is every time the pallet fork goes either to the left or the right it's so like here when we're flipping the fork over so to the left is one beat to the right two to the left three to the right four to the left five and if that happens say uh, within one second it's five beats per second or an 18,000 beats per hour movement and of course beats are ticks and talks so a uh, watch with 18,000 beats per hour would say tick tock five times in one second and it also means that the second's hand moves five times in one second because every time the pallet fork moves to the left or right it lets the escape wheel escape half a tooth. And of course, every time the escape wheel rotates a little bit, the rest of the wheels in the train also rotate. So that means that the second hand will move slightly. So in an 18,000 BPH movement, you will see that the second hand moves five times per second, which looks a little bit stuttery to the eye. 36,000 is then of course twice as much as 18,000 so you will have 10 beats per second or 10 ticks and tocks per second and the second hand will move 10 times per second and it will look very very smooth now that's what you can see and apart from the aesthetics the real reason why the Swiss and uh, the Japanese were uh, trying to be the first ones to come up with the 36 BPH movement back in the mid 60s was because you get a certain gyro effect as well. So your watch will run more stable and uh, thus more accurately. Especially when you move positions with your hand that impacts uh, the accuracy of the movement. And with that little gyro effect, the accuracy will stay much more stable. It might be worth uh, noting that uh, marine chronometers and the detent escapement 
typically beat at 14,400 bits per hour, so actually going in the opposite direction. Although uh, some of them also beat at 18,000. So it should be clear that uh, high beat rate isn't uh, the end all for uh, movements. For the Swiss Libre escapement, it does provide uh, accuracy benefits. But there are some pretty major drawbacks as well. Chief among them being that there is much more wear in the movement. Case in point here could be uh, Longines Ultracron, which was introduced with a 36,000 BPH movement initially, but uh, which has switched to a 28,800 movement uh, just a few years later due to wear. Now let's uh, continue this and talk a little bit later. We're just uh, going to look at the automatic module first. This little piece here is the magic lever. Going to look uh, much more in detail when we uh, assemble the watch again. And here is this uh, faceted uh, mineral glass. Really cool uh, crystal on the watch. But it is a bit damaged, so we're going to have to change it. By the way, the case looks as it has never been polished. So we're not going to be the first ones. An unpolished case on a vintage watch is much more valuable than a polished one. Even if it's polished well. So in general we're only going to polish the watch if it is too damaged. Alright, so you saw me knocking out uh, the mineral glass. That's actually not necessary on this uh, model. We could have simply taken the bezel off. But it's fun to use the hammer sometimes. You know, when the kids go too crazy and you better have complaints. Feels good just taking a hammer and smashing something. Even though that hammer is a tiny little brass hammer with a plastic end. Still a hammer, technically. So we see there's a fair bit of DNA and crud inside the case, along the bezel, also on the underside. So I'm going to clean that up, first by using some uh, pegwood, and then afterwards we're going to put this into the ultrasonic. One thing that's important here, when you have uh, case backs with medallions like this one, you do not put the case back in the ultrasonic. That will damage it. And we're also going to look at uh, the gasket in the case back. See, this is what typically happens. It becomes very stiff and brittle, and obviously doesn't really do anything anymore. So with all that, we have uh, everything disassembled, ready for the cleaning machine. Now this is an automated uh, cleaning machine. It's uh, certainly overkill for uh, someone who just want to do this as a hobby. And you can find cleaning machines around the same concept for around, let's say, five, six hundred uh, euros or dollars. Alright, we got everything back from the cleaning machine. First thing we're going to do, as always, is to oil the shock settings. And Psycho, of course, uses uh, their dio shock, uh, shock setting, which is uh, quite good. Often mistaken for the KIF. But it's a uh, tire shock. It's got uh, three leaves on this little uh, spring instead of four. And it's quite convenient to put in, typically. A little bit fiddly sometimes, but uh, generally quite uh, smooth. For picking up that spring, it's actually better to use uh, Rodico. It's quite easy to uh, ping it when you use the tweezers. Now 
Now while we do this, we can get back to our discussion on bitrate. So we talked about uh, wear being the main negative point, about uh, 36,000 uh, movements. And it's a little bit of a common misconception that uh, the wheels uh, rotate towards, towards, towards as fast. Not really sure where that came from, but twice as fast. And that's of course not the case. Basically the center wheel will always rotate uh, one time per hour. And typically the fourth wheel will rotate uh, once per minute. But what will uh, really rotate much faster is uh, the pallet fork and the balance, and also the escape wheel. So the main thing to keep in mind is that the escapement will have a much higher rotational speed. And the main consequence of that is uh, that uh, the pallet fork, when we oil it, we actually grease it. Use a pretty thick and uh, heavy uh, grease that won't be uh, splashed off due to uh, centripetal forces. But one last comment also on this. Pretty much all watches nowadays have uh, 28,800 beats per hour as a standard. And for the aesthetics, it's quite difficult to see the difference between a 28,800 uh, seconds hand moving or 36,000 seconds hand moving. They both look very smooth. All right. We put in the barrel. We put in uh, the hack. The barrel, as you can say, says uh, do not open. So I just said, hi, and didn't open it. I'm going to see if that uh, still works well. It was a bit of a fad back in the 60s and 70s to have these uh, sealed units, do not open barrels, which you were then supposed to just uh, replace every time you service the watch. which was fine when you had uh, spare parts, but nowadays it's a bit more difficult. One very nice thing with a lot of Psycho watches, they have uh, jeweled bearings uh, for the barrel arbor. And we see that even in this very nice uh, caliber, also nicely finished, by the way. They still have a riveted wheel. So the crown wheel is riveted on. At least there's no plastic. And most hacks have this little extension that fits into the groove in the sliding pinion. So we need to place the sliding pinion accordingly. So the keyless works is uh, quite straightforward, for being Psycho that is. Somehow Psycho always has like 300 more parts in the keyless works than the other manufacturers. And it's also quite common that a few of those parts seem to be like uh, late additions kind of uh, band-aid solutions. You just get the feeling that uh, late in the production run, someone discovered that uh, the parts were popping out a position. So I said, okay, let's just uh, screw down one little extra piece to hold it down. There's a couple of those in uh, this one. Still, it's a very good movement and a very fun movement to work on as well. But the keyless works in psychos are just something else. All 
All right, testing that it works. Using some 9504, both uh, on the keyless works and for the Canon pinion. You can also use uh, D5 or 8200, that kind of thing. in place we can put in a quick set lever which has his own little piece to keep things in place and to keep all of those in place we'll put on another band-aid for the pallet fork I mentioned a few times that we use uh, something called fixo drop just uh, thought maybe I could show in a bit more detail how we do that. We put the uh, pallet fork into this uh, little uh, capsule. And then uh, the liquid is inside this uh, 80 euro time glass uh, thingy. Incredibly expensive, this little piece of glass. So we can inverse the pallet fork. And what this does is that it uh, keeps the uh, lubrication on the pallet uh, stones in place. Now for greasing the pallet stones, gonna try to shake your hands that. We put a little bit of this uh, grease on the exit pallet stone and then we forward uh, the escape wheel a few times so that we spread this grease onto the different teeth in the escape wheel. And that way the entire escape wheel has a little bit of lubrication on its teeth. Okay, let's see if this uh, baby wants to run. Before taking the watch over to the time grapher and uh, just uh, the timing, we're going to give it a good wind and put a little bit of oil into the different pivots. For uh, the wheel train, it's typically in 9010. For the center wheel, we we'll use uh, D5 or HP 1300. And we see that the amplitude is at a completely different level. The beat error is uh, still at one millisecond, which is in fact acceptable. But for watches with uh, mobile stud carriers, where you can easily adjust the beat error, we're going to take this out. So that's the first thing we do. And then when we have uh, the beat error out, we can adjust uh, the rate. So that looks uh, better. And then we can get back onto the dial side and work on the calendar works. Also quite straightforward. So I'm gonna just uh, shut up a little while. I need a break anyway.
not talking was uh, much easier, huh? Maybe I should just make uh, these videos say uh, some more. All right, I will start talking again. We got into the automatic uh, works, and we have uh, the magic lever here. This uh, fits onto this uh, asymmetric uh, post. And then you have those two poles, one on each side of this uh, intermediate wheel. So it uh, does resemble uh, the IWC uh, Peloton system a little bit. It is much simpler, not quite as effective, or efficient rather, but it's a pretty uh, ingenious uh, system. important to uh, actually oil the uh, poles a little bit. Now for those of you who have seen uh, the other Psycho uh, video I did, I did bash Psycho quite a bit for uh, the finish. But looking at the, this movement, it's a beautiful movement. It's good finish. The Japanese have a different uh, philosophy there than the Swiss. But I think this movement absolutely looks uh, high quality. We're putting some uh, Lubetta V106 in the ball bearing for the rotor. And then we can put this uh, fabulous uh, dial back on. And testing to see that everything works after we put the dial on. One thing to pay particular attention to is that uh, the dial hole is centered so that uh, the can and pinion, the hour wheel and so forth, the tubes sticking out in the middle are in the middle. If they're not uh, then you risk uh, that uh, the dial actually presses on the hands and either stop them or makes them run uh, irregularly. With a calendar movement, or a date movement like this, we first turn the crown so that the date changes, then we know it's midnight, then we put the hour hand to point to midnight, then we check that uh, the hour hand uh, doesn't uh, rub on the dial, that it's parallel to the dial, then we can put uh, the minute hand also on uh, midnight, I mean, you could potentially uh, put this on at 23 minutes, but uh, it's much easier to align, of course, when it points straight to an hour. And then rinse and repeat. We want to make sure that uh, the date switches at midnight. It's never going to be exactly midnight, but we want to have it at least uh, within 15 minutes to or fro and we should be able to get it uh, within five minutes. Now, for the crystal, we got hold of a new old stock crystal with the matching gasket. And the gasket is actually nice and supple. Still, we're going to put a little bit of uh, silicone on it. And 
the way we fit this is by first putting the gasket into the case and then we press the crystal in of course we have to align this given that uh, you have these uh, facets in the crystal you don't want those pointing to seven minutes uh, past uh, half past one if that is actually time you of course want to align it so it's uh, straight and then we can put uh, the bezel on to hold everything in place it's a pretty simple system uh, quite similar to what the rolex uses for instance with the new crystal on we're just about ready to case the movement again just want to make sure we uh, remove any dust or debris inside of the crystal And the last thing we're going to do is uh, put the rotor back on. And that means we're almost finished. Time flies when you're having fun. Oh, I forgot the case back. Let's put a new gasket on there as well. Yeah, it would be a bit embarrassing to forget the case back. And with the case back safely on, we're going to put the bracelet back on. And then we can enjoy this beautiful watch on the wrist but first a teaser next time we're gonna look at an omega chronostop that has a few problems but we'll uh, try to resolve them and then we can enjoy this beautiful grand psycho on the wrist that is a mighty fine watch that is something else a very rare and very beautiful gs61 So with that, thanks for watching. Hope you'll uh, find the time to join us next time for the chrono stop. Until then. Ta-ta. <coughs>